read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey lady listeners welcome back it's been a break for us it's been a minute it has been a minute we have not met in like 20 days or some shit like that like it's been a hot minute I was, I was listening to ella good uh this week you know quality control go through and listen to the episode um and i was like oh it's october 3rd i was like was that legitimately the last time we talked has it been 20 days yeah it feels like forever it's probably not right but whatever that's what it well, felt we're like. recorded a couple in a row because we had a we break did. week and then I was going uh-huh. out of town and yeah I know and all kinds of shit happens like on our break um my dad went in the hospital <laughs> you know it was like it was crazy though my mom said to me at one point because my my dad was having like some chest pains and went to the hospital ended up having to have open heart surgery it was like huge all of a sudden you know I mean and they tell you like it's not a big deal. Like, you know, it, it happens to people all the time now. And it does. It's a pretty common thing now. But it's still pretty scary when you have a what you assume is a healthy person walk in the hospital. And all of a sudden, it's like they have to have a major operation. But yeah. we were sitting in the hospital and it was like Monday. And my mom was like, oh, my gosh, do you not have to record tonight? And I was like, actually, we're on break this week. <laughs> Believe it or not. Like, it worked out perfectly. <laughs> So the timing was awesome on that. <laughs> I'd actually really thought that I was like, this is weird timing. I know. I did too. <laughs> I was like, man, I guess if it was going to happen, now was the time. So yeah. yeah. So we had a long break after that. We were re recorded some stuff, but now we're back. We have a brand new week. We have Gemma Weir with us and she's brought us a book called A Little More Obsession. And we'll talk about her in just a little bit, but we're going to catch up. I want to know, how was your vacation? How was was Vegas slash Sedona? How was it? It was really fun. It was nice and relaxing. Yeah. Two days in Vegas is really enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Because, like, the first day we had, like, one, and we were up, like, six or seven hundred dollars. And the next day we lost it all back. I'm trying to get out of here. Hey, the house is going to get is. But I will say, I was so excited. They were like, so we go in Vegas. I get carded twice in the casino. Stop it. Twice. They stop you in the casino to card I was gambling. Yes. (gasps) And I got ID'd twice when I was gambling. And and so I won't let up about it. I keep bringing it up. (laughs) up. We get to Sedona and we Mm -hmm. drive out to this other little town that, you know, Mm -hmm. the band Tool? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He owns a winery, and there's this vineyard place where you can do the test, uh, tasting. And my husband loves wine. He loves mm-hmm. tool. We walk yeah. into this bar, and we sit down, and they're like, can I see your ID? Like, just you? <laughs> just me out of everybody. I was Stop. like. Stop. <laughs> I bet you were just like, oh, and they all, hold on they, a all second. three of them literally groaned. When she, <laughs> she, she, <laughs> like, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I can hear it now. Oh my God. That's funny. I love it. And the, but the girl said it's the barrette. When they, the, when they oh, all grow, she was like, you're what? like barrette in your hair? Yeah, because I wear barrettes that like have hearts on them mm-hmm. or gummy bears. Yeah. And they're like, she's like, it's the barrette in the glasses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. So that's what everybody needs to do. Okay. If you're looking to look, if you want to look younger, grab a barrette some glasses you got it well in all honesty i have botox in my forehead too my forehead does not look well. so oh my god i saw this joke one time about um this woman goes like to plastic surgeon get botox and she's like oh well i look young now he's like no you'll just look like all your friends that got botox <laughs> god because i was like it's you know most of the time i i know it helps like smooth skin but i don't really feel like it's anti-aging no it is I just think it's anti-aging it- in this way i'll tell you why because okay i hate to say it but my even my dad we've talked about it when mm-hmm. my parents are just sitting there if your parents are just sitting there and mm-hmm. their face is like completely relaxed yeah you can see the lines in their forehead where if they were to lift their eyebrows yeah yeah so uh-huh. if you get botox early on in life starting mm-hmm. in your late 30s 
It's to prevent those lines from forming. Okay. So that when your face is neutral, you're never going to have those lines. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah. From lifting your eyebrows over and over again. Yeah. So those lines never form. Well, and you don't smoke either. <laughs> and I think that helps a lot with like just keeping your skin even toned and less wrinkles. But, and you also stay out of the sun. I stay so out of the good. sun. Mm-hmm. Mine's only prevention Botox at the moment. Yeah. I just have mm-hmm. to do the forehead. That's nice. So far. I've never done it, but I don't really care like enough to do it. You know, I'd love, I, if you want to do it, like I said, I have no problems with people doing it. I no tea, no shade. You want to put Botox in your whole body. That does nothing for me. Like I, I, I don't, it's it doesn't fillers, matter to me. It's fillers that scare me because Botox goes away. Yeah. It's only like, it depends actually how active you are. But don't fillers go away too? They don't last forever. They last. Like lip lip injections and stuff. Mm. Those don't last. Yeah. You have to get them dissolved. Oh, God. If you really want to get them all the way out. Yeah. Where Botox will last. Botox only lasts me like three or four months, but I'm super active. I run three miles a day generally. Yeah. The more active you are, the faster. Like sweat it out and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mine would last forever then. (laughs) Um, while my dad was in the hospital, I was like driving back and forth. And one day I was at home and I was picking up my kids and I text my hairdresser and I was like, if I come to you with wet hair, will you give me bangs? And the late, my stylist is my friend too in real life. Mm -hmm. And Shannon was like, you good? And I was like, (laughs) nope, I'm not, but can we do this anyways? And she's like, you know what? All right, come on in. And so like, that was my... That was my stressful, like, uh, I'm just going to cut bangs. Let's just they look good, do but Thank do they you. bother they, you? No, like right now I had to take off. That. When I wear my glasses, they actually don't bother me as much. But I had to take them off because they're such a bad glare when we record the podcast. It's like you can't even see my face. But no, normally they don't. I, I said maybe it's like an annual thing because I did them like this month last year too. So I don't know. But you know, I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, if I had really bad wrinkles on my forehead, I would just get bangs. Mm-hmm. I feel like that would go a long way to cover up wrinkles, even around oh, my eyes sure. and stuff, too. So just a pro tip out there, guys. <laughs> get bangs. I like bangs. Like, I've had bangs before, and they look mm-hmm. not bad on me. Yeah, yeah. It's just that I don't like dealing with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like to be so, able to pull back and not worry about And not have to do anything. I know. But I will say, like, it's cute now, I think, to wear like a knot with mm-hmm. bangs and stuff. It is. And so that part's easy because I just have to get up in the morning and kind of like flatten them down and that's it. Because mm-hmm. apparently in my sleep, I just push them out of my face and they're like straight up. But <laughs> anyways, um, I went to a Lizzo concert last week. Um, my friend had gotten me tickets and um, as like a gift, it was so nice. And so it, originally I was like trying to stress about like, gosh, do I really want to go to this? Like, you know, do I have time? Like, there's all this stuff going on. I don't really want to go to a concert in the midst of all this. You know, what if something goes wrong? And it's like, I was back and forth a lot of it of, of, up until the day before. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go. Mm-hmm. And so I went, and let me tell you, if you ever get a chance to go to a Lizzo concert, even if you're not a huge fan, it is such an uplifting show. I've seen multiple people say that on social media. It is so uplit. This is the second time. I saw her in 2019 when she was doing her first tour when she came through. She came through um, Charlotte and she was in a really small outdoor venue and it sold out so fast. And I went, um, I actually went with Claire Contreras. I remember that. I was just thinking, yeah. you go with Claire? Yeah, I did. Yep. And um, my stylist friend, Shannon, she came to my other friend. And um, so we all go. And I remember Lizzo was there and it was hot as fuck. It was standing room only. It was miserable, but also incredible. Mm-hmm. But she said on stage, she was like, y'all, next time I'll come through, I'm getting an arena. And she was like, we're going to sell that bitch out. And she fucking did it too. Like, oh, again, wow. like two seconds later, sold out. But um, so like she puts on such a great show because it's not only like she dances her ass off and she sings and she has like performances and you know, like on stage backup dancers and everything is such a good show. But she actually stops and like talks for a while too and explains like what she's doing and her message and 
why she's trying to uplift people and, you know, all this stuff. And at one point she comes out and she's like reading everybody. So she's like, I want to read signs. Hold your signs up, everybody. And then like she goes through and one of them was so funny. She was like, shit, I don't even want to read that out loud. And she starts laughing and it said, I'm going to dress up as Chris Evans for Halloween. So Lizzo slides into my DMs. <laughs> the big joke is that like Chris Evans is in love with her. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, but then she goes to each section of the fucking arena and calls people out. She's like, you in the green, I see you. You with the purple feather boa, I see you, girl. You're beautiful. Like, Aww. it is amazing. Like, she takes time to individually call people out. She brought people up on stage. She signed some woman's leg. Like, it, it was just wild how personable it was. She was up there for over two hours. Yeah. And it was like, by the time it was over, we just walked down. And I like had tears in my eyes at one point. This one girl, oh my God, bless her heart. She had this sign up and it said, and I don't know the correct terminology, but I guess she was bulimic. But um, it was something like, is it something to the effect, effect of like, Lizzo, you, I was bulimic and your music saved me. And Lizzo looked mm-hmm. at her and she was like, you saved yourself. Aww. And like, I was just like. just pouring down my face I was like oh my god like it really is like it is a spiritual uplifting yeah going to see her in concert she's incredible so I just can't recommend it enough if you you, like I said even if you're a casual Lizzo fan it's worth going it's so fun I will say though that Lotto opened up for her big Lotto did Mm -hmm. and holy fuck I'm glad I didn't take my daughter to this show because this this guy let me say she comes out and first of all the songs that she sings are nasty but I like them I mean they're okay but they're like a lot of TikTok songs or whatever I'm trying to remember some of the ones she had, but I can't even sing them. But at one point, she takes the microphone, she holds it over her mouth, and she starts doing it like she's giving oh my God. to the microphone. And then all her backup dancers come out holding these signs that say pussy on them. And then it says on the back, it says, my body, my choice. And it was, just, it was awesome. So, like, I, that was actually really cool. But I was just like, oh, I'm probably glad I didn't bring my 11-year-old to this. <laughs> like, because they were just doing, they brought a guy on stage and did like a lap dance for him and stuff. And he was just like, oh my God, he's probably like, what am I doing at this concert? But it was a that, good time. That reminds me, I think I haven't been on since I went to the protest with my No, mom. you did not. You told me you went, you sent pictures. Because, oh my God. Okay, so stuff. tell me, was this like a, was it like a group protest or like just one you guys did? Like. How did this start? Let me tell you. So, um, I can't even like, so my grandma, I don't know how she finds these things, I guess. So my grandma texts in a group text. Mm -hmm. There's a march in Kearney. I'm like, somebody's playing with you, grandma. But I click the link and it goes through and it really is a sign up. And then I realize I got an email from the Women's March and it shows the locations. And there is one in Kearney. There's one in Kansas City. There's one in Lawrence, which is Lawrence KU. I expect that. And then one up in Atchison, another country part, but more to the east or the yeah. west. I'm like, is this really? So then I email the person. Uh-huh. I'm like, is this really happening in Kearney tomorrow? And the person emails back. Yes. Um, make sure you bring sunglasses and a hat. And their email was like, kitty on my desk. Like their title. I'm like, what? Okay. So I didn't, I don't know why I didn't feel like going, but my grandma's like, uh, my grandma's like, do you guys want to go? My mom's like, yeah. And so I'm like, well, I don't really have a choice. I guess I got to go now. (laughs) (laughs) And then, you know, Oliver's going. So it's like four generations Uh of people. So, oh, my dad comes too, because we're in Yeah. I was actually a little worried. I was like, are we really going to do this? Are people really going to show up? We're in Carney. This is weird. But then I was like. My dad will be probably packing, so we'll be well, all right. And he probably <laughs> knows everybody too that's gonna be there. <laughs> it's about, Jim, shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I can see him doing that. Mind your business. <laughs> that's funny. He does. Cause today we yeah. had an accident in town. He's like, I'm gonna call the fire marshal. I was like, Dad, I think right? he's busy. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a bridge fell in town. He's busy yeah. at the moment. Yeah. But um 
so we get there and yeah he's wearing Oliver made him a sign that says I'm with her and the air is like pointing in every direction yeah. and my dad mm-hmm. does hold it that's cute but we get there and I don't see anybody we're at yeah. town hall and I'm like what are we there's nobody here I like drive around to see mm-hmm. if I missed it if we're late mm-hmm. and this woman and her daughter come out and she's like are you here for the for the march or whatever and mm-hmm. i was like yeah she's like it was me that set it up says the girl and she can't yeah. be about 15 or 16 oh my god and i'm like i guess you can go onto the website and just make one in a town and we nice. were literally the only people that signed up for it oh our family that's sweet so, though so we get out there and we just sat on the corner for like an hour and you know we, yeah. we actually didn't get any we got some dirty looks, but nobody said anything mean. We got a lot of cheers. Good. Actually. That's awesome. But, but. the little girl signs, mm-hmm. I, di- I didn't find out until later that I guess she was um, a bit autistic, which makes uh-huh. sense after interacting with her with mm-hmm. a little bit. But her signs, oh, my God. What? It was like, I hope daddy doesn't rape me. <gasps> what? Mel, you're lying. And our what if daddy rapes me? And I'm just like, I can't. Stop. But thankfully, it was like this big. It was not very big. Like, we had regular poster boards. What? You didn't tell her what we write, did you? No. (laughs) (laughs) But I was like, but I did say, you aren't fucking around. No, (laughs) Jesus Christ. And her mom was like, I let her put whatever she wanted. I was like, but Good then for you, mom. I gotta show yeah. you. I should take it. I need to put the picture because then she has it like this. It looks like fire and people like burning or reaching up and screaming and bleeding down over the work. I was like, she painted this. It wasn't like a sign she wrote on. It was yeah. like hand painted, taking her time on a canvas thingy. Oh, my God. And it was people burning? It, it almost looks like it was either – it could be people in the shapes of waves. I guess it's however you interpret it. Like, it to me, it looked yeah. like fiery people. Okay. Like, the way the fires waved, it reminded me of a body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What with its arms reaching upward. Did it say anything? The words were written in this, like, the bottom center of it. What did it say? Daddy, don't rape me or something oh, like that. Oh, fuck. That was the... Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh, my God. But I was Man, just like... That's, usually that's it takes heavy. me a lot to, like, react. Like, yeah. I can no. usually be very, like, mm-hmm. stoic. Uh-uh. <laughs> that was just like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Wow. Like, that's a lot. Yeah. I thought when we were at the Women's March together, the ones that were, like... Pizza rolls, not gender rolls. You know, I didn't mm. see Daddy don't rape me. Jesus Christ. It was like, what if Daddy rapes me wow. or something like that? I was like, well, she's kind of got a point. Well, I did see this ad the other day that had like a trigger warning before it where this all you see is the doctor and he's like talking. He was like, the baby's doing great. You know, that's what we're going to focus on right now. Have you seen that one? I've seen a few like that. Where, yeah. And then all of a sudden, the doctor walks out of the room and the camera pans up, pans over, and it's like a child. Mm-hmm. And she's like, what? And it, I was just like, oh, my God, that's that's all the advertisement you need. Right I've there. seen a few that have, like, took the air out of my lungs. Like, I know. Oh. That one got me. I was like, yes, I needed that warning before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what I also saw, just FYI, when I was on the way back and forth between North and South Carolina, there's a huge billboard. It's gigantic on the side of the road right before you cross the border into North Carolina. And it says, in North Carolina, abortion is legal. And I was like, honk, honk, fuck yeah, it is. <laughs> and it's like, the sign is like paid for by the Republican Party. And I'm like, you're doing the wrong kind of advertising, okay? Because you're literally telling people where to go to get an abortion. And it's not in your state. <laughs> like, I, don't I also it. think that <laughs> Kansas let everybody know what's up. I that mean, Kansas did. Kansas did. They voted on if abortion should be illegal or not. And they said it should be legal. Yeah. Kansas. 
fucking yeah. Kansas. Fucking Kansas. That right. shows you that even a huge <laughs> chunk of the Republican Party is for is mm-hmm. in support of keeping it out of the state. It shouldn't business. be a state issue to begin with. But that that's neither here nor we don't have to get on that train wreck yeah. again today. Again. Okay. <laughs> um, have you eaten all your Halloween candy yet? I haven't gotten any Halloween. Candy. What? We don't Why get to go treaters. I know, but it's like the Reese's pumpkins. Aren't those like your favorite? Oh, yeah, I got those. Those will just turn to Christmas trees next week. <laughs> That's true. They're just um, down in my little, I have a little jar I keep them in. So we got a ton of candy because we get a lot of trick or treaters. And um, didn't you go to Celia's last year? You were talking about in the last episode how she does like a big thing for Halloween. She does a huge thing. She's having a huge party this Do year. Do you miss that though? Like going, like doing a big thing for Halloween since you guys don't get trick or treaters. Do you miss doing that? No, because I didn't realize when I went there that she invited all these people over, or I wouldn't have gone. <laughs> well, not the party, but like the <laughs> trick or treating aspect. Of I it. like passing out candy. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the most fun. Like my kids would rather do that than go get candy. I my did stay at the like, house and pass. They went out to go do candy, and I stayed at yeah, the house and passed yeah. out the candy where they took their kids. That's Me so and fun. Did. I love that. But um. We got a ton of candy because we get a lot of trick or treaters. We have like a like I think I counted. I think we had like fourteen hundred pieces. Jesus, I know, but we'll go through it. I mean, I know be, you will. Be you guys get so many. Yeah, and um, so I actually broke one of the bag open and I got caught today <laughs> taking out Milky Ways, and I was like, "These are the best ones." I will fuck up a Milky Way. I won't buy them any other time of year, but somehow for Halloween, if there's a Milky Way. Bitch, look out. I'm coming for it. Mm. Like, that's one that won't see the light of day. Milk that, duds are my weakness. Oh, if I that, open a box of milk duds, it's and they're so bad for you. Well, I was going to say, don't this, like, hurt your teeth? No. I have strong back teeth. Mm. Um, Let's see. Which we should probably talk. Well, I was going to ta- talk a little bit about our taboo books. But maybe we'll wait till Thursdays. You episode. can do it real quick. You want to do it real quick? Yeah. We'll talk about, we'll talk about them both episodes. How about that? We'll start right. a little bit now. So Mel and I came up with this brilliant idea <laughs> to come up with a new pen name. We're calling it AR Taboo. And we are releasing really, really short taboo books. They'll be out right now. Yeah. If you're hearing this now, they're there. So if you see a book that um, a cover, it says AR Taboo. That's us. But the books will only be available on our website and smashwords.com because Smashwords is like the Wild West and anything fucking goes. As long as you're over 18, anything goes. Literally anything. 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 So we just like, Mel's been on a kick about reading Smashwords lately. I have. And she was like, we haven't written really dirty like this in a long time. These books are like 15, 20 pages. Well, top. here was, they were, yeah, the ones, ours are actually a little bit longer than some of the ones I've been reading. They're around like 3,000 words. But when I was mm-hmm. reading them, they were lacking just like a touch of, I don't even want to call it softness, but yeah, soft. Like I almost felt sweet. like, yeah, just I needed a dash of sweet. Like just like, and I love you. Kind of thing, or <clears throat> like a little tenderness. Yeah, I mean, I think that they want the women, but not like in a possessive way. Sometimes, oh, okay, you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like the guys are just really horny and they want to get off, uh-huh. and it's hot and stuff. But I still want this that possessive. I there's need a reason her. they want to get off with her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, okay, I yeah. need this person. Mm-hmm. Only this her person. Her specifically. Only yeah. her or mm-hmm. generally as a reader, women, yeah. you. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's missing that. Like sometimes mm-hmm. when I read it, I'm like, I think a man might have wrote this. I could see that. Yeah. And I was like, it just, I just felt like there just needed like, you know, something's crooked. And I'm like, it mm-hmm. just needs a little. <laughs> it's like a little <laughs> And it would be perfect. Like, yeah. I don't think any of them I've read are like, mm-hmm. like, that was exquisite. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I'm like, it's, you know, it's just a little bit to this way. And it would have been perfect. 
Well, that's why we started writing to begin with. It is. Was because we read daddy books that we love, but there was like, None. okay, there was, it just needs to li- be a little bit more this way and then it'll be perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was like, that's why we started writing. And so when we wrote, there's, there's three books, it's called Taking Turns, Hours to Share, and then um, Team Player. And like I said, they're all super short, but they're, they're taboo. Like they are bannable books on literally every retailer. Oh yeah, they wouldn't be able mm-hmm. to be loaded to anywhere else. To any book retailer except for Smashwords and our website. Mm-hmm. So that's why they're on there. We leave a lot of it open to interpretation, but if you've read our books, um, the Force Submission series, or if you've read Trailer Park Virgin, or yeah, those are probably pretty close. Um, these are these are a lot like that. Yeah. So yeah. So there is a lot, there's warnings. There's not, I don't even know. There's not even a specific trigger warning. It's just, you need to know going into these, these aren't like normal Alexa fluffy, sweet, fleshed out a little bit, you know, kind of stories. These are just straight basic fucking to the point. Yeah, it's a shot of erotica. That is just straight erotica. And it's like taboo. So I don't know how else. Maybe I'll read the book bios on Thursday's episode. Oh, that's a good idea. So that'll be a, that'll be your quick little shot of it. So, all right, let's talk about Gemma before we get too late into this. Um, Like I said earlier, she's brought us a book. It's called A Little More Obsession. It's a bonus short story that's an extension of her book, Obsession, which is her newest release. It's, like I said, it's by Gemma Weir. Um, Obsession is, um, let's see. Hold on. Oh, let me read you the book bio so I can tell you about that one. Obsession. To be occupied or fill the mind with someone continually and to a troubled extent. As soon as I realized she existed, I lost the ability to look away. She was always desired. She was always destined to be mine. I'm Sebastian Lockwood, a king among men, a king to get to take what they want. A little bird disagreed. She fought me, disobeyed me, even though we both know she belongs to me. So I broke her, bent her to my will. I pushed too hard, loved too much, and she ran from me. But letting her go was impossible, so I chased. Hiding in the shadows, silently pulling the strings that would bring her, that would bind her to me. Two years have passed. I've waited long enough. It's time to reclaim my queen, to take what's mine. The trap is set, a gilded cage worthy of royalty, and only I have the key. I'll make her pay for leaving me. I'll make her love me, want me as much as I do her. I couldn't stop if I tried. She's my obsession. I love it. That's such a good. She writes super possessive heroes. Like I remember one of her first books that really took off was like the mountain man one. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, she really dug her heels into the possessive man. Yes. I love it. So it's like her thing Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, again, this is the bonus story from the original book, Obsession, which is um, the newest release in her Alpha Hole series. Um, so if you like what you're listening to, you can go read Obsession and it will just expand this world. Um, she's giving away a signed copy of Obsession this week. And right now she has a pre-order up. It's the last book in her Mountain Man series. Um, it's called Loving the Mountain Man and it's out in January. So make sure you check that out. Um, I guess that's it for now. We'll send them them in. Yeah. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. This is A Little More Obsession by Gemma Weir. Read for you by Megan Kelly. Epilogue. Starling. The intensity of his glare has always scared and at times excited me. Now that I know the depths of his love and obsession, a little of the fear had ebbed. But it's still there, an undercurrent of uncertainty that burns just below my skin. Sebastian Lockwood, my boyfriend, has the capacity to hurt me. He has in the past. Like a toddler who didn't get his way when I refused to fall in line with his plans for me, he threw a tantrum and he broke me. I might not have forgiven him for his behavior, but I have, at least, decided to try to forget. Some days that works better than others. So much of my trauma from the last three years stems from the hands of the man I'm in love with. I mean, 
Who falls for their tormentor? I'm sure we have enough issues between us to keep a shrink well paid for the rest of their life, but despite it all, every path leads us back to one another. Ours isn't a pretty love story. Sebastian didn't swoop in and save me. I'm still very much broken, possibly unfixable. But in the shattered remnants of what remains of the person I was before he stomped my narrow life to pieces, we're forging a future together. Come here, little bird, he demands, fighting to stop himself from forcing me to do as he says. A part of him wants me to come to him willingly, but the rest of him enjoys that I'm the one person in his world who doesn't bow to his whims. I'm going out with Sammy. I told you that. Come here. His demand becomes an order, and yet my feet stay planted to the ground. My red-painted lips turn up into a smirk, and I plant my hand on my hip, arching my eyebrow at him and daring him to do his worst. Everything I'm doing right now is like waving a red rag at a bull, and my heart is beating wildly in my chest even as I smile. Sebastian hates when I go out with my best friend Sammy. He hates it more that I refuse to let him come. I could console and reassure him instead of taunting him, but the part of me that still hates him enjoys watching him squirm as he tries, and generally fails, to calm the raging insane beast that resides inside. Little bird. I will happily turn your old room into an actual gilded cage and lock you up there again until you learn to behave. He threatens, his fingers clenching and relaxing rhythmically, as if he's using the action to try and control his anger. Evan, Clay, and Hunter wouldn't let you. You think they could stop me? Actually, I do. I taunt, arching my brow in challenge. What would they do to save you if the champagne you've been sipping while you did your makeup was laced with a sedative that will kick in any moment? Do you think they'd come to your rescue if I took you away from Kingsacre and kept you captive in our own castle? You could be my willing prisoner. A chill runs through me, and I feel my heart skip a few beats. I know it's just an idle threat, but he has drugged me in the past. Last time... He sedated me, then had a tracker implanted in my neck. That was the day he told me I was his, my last day of true innocence, before he tainted my world and marred every meaningful relationship I had with his presence. What makes you think I'd be willing? He's the one to smile now. Because you love me? It isn't a statement. He knows I love him. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. But after seeing how his behavior has affected me, he struggles to understand how I could feel anything for him after everything he's done to hurt me. Are you planning on drugging and abducting me? I ask semi-seriously. Not today, he admits with a careless shrug. Why not? I question. His eyes soften and his hands relax. Because I love you? and I want you to love me, too. His confession burns away the fear that's kept me rooted to this spot in arguing. Walking towards him, I curl my arms around his neck and let him pull me into him. I love you, I tell him, pushing onto my tiptoes and pressing my lips to his. Just as I expected, Sebastian collars my throat with his palm, taking charge of our kiss, needing to take back some of the control I've stripped from him by refusing to acquiesce to his demands. I wish you'd do as you're told, he growls against my lips. No, you don't, I laugh. You love it when I fight you. Maybe I'd enjoy your obedience more, he says playfully. Have you grown bored with me already? Are you wishing you waited for another freshman to obsess over? There's no one else for me but you, little bird. You, of all people, know the lengths I'll go to keep you. Why don't you and Sammy stay here? We have plenty of that margarita mix you like. 
and I'll order and take out from that Italian place we ate at last week. No, we're going out to a party like normal college kids. King's Acre isn't a normal college, and there aren't any normal kids here apart from the scholarship recipients, and we know what happened last time you were around them. I flinch, my mind flashing back to the party I went to two months ago, where I was almost raped. Sebastian saved me by kicking down a door before Chase Lawrence, King's Acre's football star, had a chance to really hurt me. I don't bother telling him that it wasn't his scholarship that made Chase feel entitled to take what I wasn't prepared to give. He doesn't care. He just wants to make a point. Sebastian has proven time and time again that he'll say or do whatever he has to do to keep me in line, even if that hurts me. Thinking of how close I came to being attacked, I pull away from Sebastian as a chill settles over me. Fuck. He hisses. I'm... Fuck. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have... He trails off, stumbling over his words. Apologizing isn't something that comes easily to him. The only child of wildly rich and successful parents, he's a typical spoiled brat who expects never to have to acknowledge his poor behavior. I need to go. Sammy's waiting for me. Starling? It's fine. I'll see you later. Starling? He calls again, taking a step forward, then pausing. It's strange to see the big bad leader of the elite, unsure. But in this moment, he's fighting his natural urge to dominate me. As much as I appreciate it, I don't know how to deal with this restrained version of him. One of the first things he ever said to me was, You're mine. He didn't care that I'd never spoken to him or that I didn't want to be his. He claimed me, and that was it. I know he's trying to be respectful of my limits, but honestly, what the fuck is this? A few months ago, if I'd have pulled away and tried to leave, he'd have pinned me to the wall with his hand around my throat and either refused to let me go or fucked me until I was too exhausted to keep fighting him. And now, he's just standing there and watching me leave? What the fuck? I know the attack affected him. I know he worries that if he pushes me too far, acts too obsessed or too controlling, I'll leave. But the truth is, a part of me misses his messed up, over-the-top insanity. I miss the thrill of pushing his buttons and watching him melt down. I might have been scared of him to a certain degree, but once I got here to King's Acre with him, I realized that I was done cowering, and I fought back. Now he's the one cowering, and I hate it. We need to find some middle ground between jailer and lover, and one that doesn't start with him tempering himself because he's scared of pissing me off. I've lived that life, played that role, and it sucks. Flouncing out of the bedroom we share, I stomp down the stairs, muttering to myself as I descend to the ground floor and find Evan leaning against the bottom of the banister, flirting with Sammy. Let me take you out, I hear him say, reaching forward and tugging at a strand of her hair. <laughs> no, she giggles, batting his hand away and pushing her long blonde hair over her shoulder. They both turn and look as they hear me approach. Babe, you look hot. I'd totally fuck you if I was that inclined, she drawls playfully. You always say that, I laugh. But to be honest, I'd fuck you in that skirt now. Evan chokes, his eyes bugging out of his head as he looks between us. Fuck. I don't know if I'm allowed to be turned on by the prospect of you guys fucking. Starling, you're my sister. Barely, I snap, rolling my eyes. We're not related. Our parents are fucking. That's it. So does that mean it's okay that my dick's hard? He asks, looking at me expectantly. Sammy laughs so hard she folds over at the waist, her arms wrapped around herself. 
Oh my god, I can't believe I used to think you were intimidating. Chuckling to myself, I stepped down the last step and moved to her side, looping my arm through hers and leaning in, pushing my breast against her side. Without me saying a word, she turns into me until our breasts are pushed together. Curling her arm around my back, she lowers her palm until it grazes my butt through my black bodycon dress. The fabric clings to my barely there curves, and I glance up at her through my lashes, smiling seductively. Do you blame him for being turned on by us together? I ask her, allowing my voice to become breathy. Sammy inhales deeply, and when she exhales, she moans this intensely sexual sound that makes Evan physically reach down and adjust his junk. I don't blame him at all. I'm wet just thinking about it. The tuxedo dress she's wearing is white, fitted, and short. She looks like a model, all long legs and willowy beauty. Sammy exudes sex and seduction. She's nothing like the babbling, overly preppy girl I met on the first day of school. That girl talked so much I didn't utter a word for over an hour, and she didn't notice. Ah, oh, fuck. Evan pants. Sammy bites her lip and leans into me as if she's going in for a kiss. At the last minute, she turns her head and licks my cheek. We both burst into laughter, and I throw my arms around her neck, hugging her. Pressing our cheeks together, we turn to look at Evan, who looks equal parts turned on and appalled. Pulling away from my friend, I nod in the direction of the door. You ready? Smiling, she nods, following me out of the house and to her golf cart that's parked in our driveway. Each dorm house has its own cart to help the rich kids who attend this school be as lazy as possible. As Sammy's housemates are more interested in fucking like bunnies in an effort to get pregnant, she's the only one who ever uses hers. I thought I was coming for you. Amelia and Anastasia have decided foursomes are the way forward, so they're literally having orgies in the living room. I'm sick of listening to people have sex. I'm sick of the place I live smelling like a brothel. I couldn't take another minute, so I thought I'd come get you instead. Why don't you just move in here? My old room is empty, and the guys are still trying to make up for ruining my life for years, so they'll basically say yes to whatever I want. I was such a miserable emo bitch to her when we met. It would have been so easy for her to just forget about me, and I'm more grateful than she'll ever be able to understand for not giving up on the haunted, silent girl who got up and left halfway through a meal in an effort to avoid her. What about Sebastian? What about him? I ask, rolling my eyes at the mention of his name. Three years ago, I would never have had the courage to speak out about him, but so much has changed in the months since I came to Kingsacre University. I regained my backbone, flipped both my middle fingers at my tormentor, and then fell in love with him. He doesn't like me, Sammy laughs dryly. He doesn't like anyone except the guys. And you? And me. I agree, exhaling wistfully. Sammy starts the cart and pulls forward to the gate. Even now, after everything that's happened, whenever I'm standing in front of this gate, there's a moment when I wonder if it'll open. I know Sebastian can keep me locked in. He did it before, kept me his prisoner. But as the gates slide open and Sammy drives through, I can't help being a little sad that... Yet again, he's letting me go. So where are we going tonight? I ask. There's a party at Daly House. That's one of the ones on its own, like our house, right? Instead of there being blocks of dorms, King's Acre has dorm houses that increase in size depending on the net worth of the occupants. There's a row of small townhouses next to the cafeteria where the scholarship kids live. Then there are cute family-style homes in tiny suburbs, then some ranch homes. The further away from the main campus buildings the dorm houses get, 
the bigger and more expensive they are. Collinwood, the house I live in with Sebastian, Evan, Clay, and Hunter, is one of the biggest and most obnoxiously impressive on the campus. We even have our own pool. Daily houses of similar size to Collinwood, only instead of being Gothic revival like our house is, it's more plantation style. Yep, the Daly family owns it, and at the minute, there are two Dailies and three of their cousins living there. They throw three or four huge parties a year. The oldest Daly is well known for supplying the whole campus with their party favors. We're going to a drug dealer's party? Sammy giggles. Yep. So are we getting fucked up? Slamming her foot on the brake, the cart stops in the middle of the path, and Sammy turns to look at me, her brows raised in question. Did you and Sebastian have an argument? No, not really, I shrug. Then why are you trying to piss him off? I'm not looking to get killed tonight. I'm not... I trail off, because... Maybe I am trying to piss him off. My life is a clusterfuck of epic proportions, but I fucking love it. I love the chaos. I love the fear. I love knowing that as terrifying as he can be, Sebastian fucking Lockwood would raise the earth for me if I needed it. Total annihilation isn't on the cards today, but I do need for him to stop being a pussy and start acting like the asshole that I crave not this weird, restrained, metrosexual asshole he's pretending to be. He didn't want me to go out tonight, I tell her, rolling my eyes. He never wants you to go out without him. But here I am, I scoff sarcastically. Wrinkling her brow, she looks at me quizzically. And you're pissed off about that? I thought you wanted to party tonight. I do, I say quickly. It's not that. It's just. I sigh. He just let me go. Ah. Lifting her chin, she smiles sadly, as if she understands completely, which would be a miracle because I don't understand why I'm feeling this way. You're looking for a little pushback. He's just. I mean. A few months ago, if he'd have told you not to go out, He'd have fucking handcuffed you to the bed or some crazy shit. Exactly. I throw my hands up in the air. I sound like a crazy person. I told him we were going to a party like normal college kids, and he made a fucked up comment about how the last time I went out with normal college kids, I almost got raped. Sammy shudders, closing her eyes and frowning. He's right. That's not the point. The point is, he said something messed up, then immediately apologized, and when I got up and went to leave, he just let me go. I mean, he didn't even follow me downstairs. He didn't try to blackmail me or coerce me. He just let me go. And that's a bad thing? That he's behaving like a normal person and not a psycho who's been stalking his high school girlfriend for years? had a tracker injected beneath her skin, and has a full team of security guards watching her every move? Yes, it's a bad thing, I shout. I don't want him to be normal. He stockholmed me into wanting the psycho, and now he's being normal. And I hate it. So, you want to get fucked up to provoke a reaction from him? I cringe. Is that really messed up? Absolutely. She laughs. <laughs> Let's fucking do it. Operation Send Sebastian Lockwood into a Psychotic Episode is on. The cart jerks forward and a laugh slips from my lips. I fucking love this girl. When we reach Daly House, the party is already in full swing and the pulse of the music evades my senses as soon as we park the cart and head towards the front door. Unlike our house, there are no electric gates, so we walk straight up to the porch and into the house, where a tall, athletic guy stops us, his arm barring the entrance. Name and house? Sammy Hartley, Alistair, 
and Starling Kennedy, Collinwood. The guy arches his brows at us, smirks, then steps aside to let us pass. Bars in the corner of the great room, ladies. Enjoy your night. I will never understand there being a free bar at a college party. I mutter as Sammy takes my hand and leads me through the enormous foyer that's packed with people. Nah, rich kids like to get wasted on the good stuff. She shrugs. Okay, so how pissed off do you want Sebastian to be? Are we talking angry sex when you get home? Or Armageddon? World's coming to an end. Because if we're going for Armageddon, then you need to tell the guys I'm moving in before Sebastian loses his ever-loving mind. Are you serious? I ask her excitedly. Do you think they'll mind? I mean, normally at King's Acre, unless your family suddenly marries into royalty or something, you don't move houses. You definitely don't move from Alice Stern to Collinswood. Well, I should be in the scholarship houses, so I think we already broke that rule. Plus, the guys love you, and more than that, I want you there. Pulling myself from the tiny purse I have hanging off my wrist, I open a group text and quickly type out a message. Me. Are all you guys cool with Sammy moving into my old room? My cell beeps with a reply almost instantly. Evan. Hell yes. Hashtag naked pillow fights. Clay. Fine by me. Hunter. Of course. The guys are fine with it, I say, turning my cell to face her. What about Sebastian? We reach the bar, and I wave away her concern. Majority rules. So, you're moving in. Biting her lip, she inhales, then nods. I'm moving in. Yes! I cry, bouncing excitedly. Let's get fucked up. We can piss off my boyfriend and celebrate you moving in in one go. Sammy orders us four shots each, and we watch the bartender pour them. When he's done, I smirk, lifting my first one and tapping it against hers before bringing the glass to my lips and throwing it back. She follows suit, immediately picking up the second. Selfie? Giggling, I nod, grabbing my glass in one hand and my cell in the other. I take a picture and then post it to all my recently created social media accounts, tagging her in the photo. Apart from Sammy, I don't really have any friends, so this is purely to aggravate my very over-the-top boyfriend. We drink the rest of the shots, then head for the dance floor. Sammy takes a picture of her wrapped around my back, her arm curled across my waist, and posts it, tagging me in it. Though he'll never admit it, Sebastian is incredibly jealous of my relationship with my bestie. He wants to be my everything, and the fact that she's important to me and fulfills a role in my life that he never can is incredibly frustrating for him. My eyes keep straying to the door, waiting for him. But after an hour, he's still not here, and I'm disappointed. I know he has eyes on me. No doubt the security team he pays to follow me wherever I go is watching and reporting my every move to him. But I don't want him to pay someone else to watch me. I want him to do it. I want to feel the hair on the back of my neck prickle with unease. I want to feel the weight of his gaze on me from across the room, even though I can't see him. I want to know that he's so consumed with me, he can't tolerate sitting back and trusting me, that he has to see for himself. I want to bask in the obsession that he's taught me to crave in the most fucked up way, and if he won't allow himself to give it to me, I'll force his hand. When a guy sidles up behind me, I know I'm pushing my luck. It's one thing taunting Sebastian with photos of me drinking and dancing, but it's another thing entirely to allow someone other than him to touch me. A hand slides over my hip, and I bat it away, turning around to the guy and shaking my head. Not interested. Lifting his hands up in a conciliatory gesture, he turns, stepping behind another girl, who welcomes his advances, grinding her ass against his crotch.
When another hour passes and Sebastian still hasn't arrived, I grab Sammy's hand and tow her towards the door. Let's get a cab into town. Nodding, she entwines our fingers together, and we push through the throngs of people, emerging into the cool night air a few moments later. Once we're outside, Sammy grabs her cells and starts texting. Uber driver will be here in five. By the time we've driven to the gate, he'll be waiting. It takes us a minute to find our cart. They all look exactly the same except for the name of the house they belong to in discreet gold lettering at the back. Finding it, we drive across campus to the main entrance gates where our Uber is waiting for us. Students are allowed to come and go as we please, so the guard at the gate just nods politely as we park the cart and swap to the car. Sammy asked the driver to take us to a bar called Tom's. Neon lights seem to fill the windows, and there's an ethereal glow emanating from inside. It has a dive bar vibe, but the area we're in is so exclusive, it probably costs the owners hundreds of thousands of dollars to make the place look like a bit of a dump. Pushing open the door, we step inside, and the thickness of the music and the lights surrounds us, making me feel almost heady as we sit down at an empty table. I don't recognize the song, but the beat thrums through my veins, lifting me and relaxing me all at once. Our server approaches our table, iPad in his hand, ready to take our order. I expect him to ID us, but he doesn't, smiling happily at us. What can I get you ladies this evening? Two vodka martinis, one extra dirty, one with a twist, and six shots of tequila. Thanks. Sammy orders, somehow managing to be polite while barely paying the server any attention. Nodding, he taps at the screen of his tablet as he leaves, his fixed smile never slipping an inch. Are we posting more pictures to social media? No, I shake my head. I thought he'd have bulldozed in and thrown you over his shoulder like a caveman by now. Do you think he's actually mellowed out a bit, or is this a play? Maybe he's losing interest. I thought it was about me but it could be that all this has just been about the chase for him. The server appears with our drinks, and I grab mine the moment he lifts it from the tray, bring it to my lips, and take a long sip. Starling, are you stupid? What? No. That boy would wear you like a fucking skin suit if he could. He's creepy, restraining, order obsessed. I mean, I know you love him or whatever so I haven't called the cops on his crazy ass. But in what world is he losing interest? When I first got here, if I'd have gone to a party, danced and drunk shots, he'd have lost his shit. And now, nothing. Didn't you sit down and have, like, that come to Jesus moment? I thought you told him you needed boundaries or whatever. Well, yeah but I expected him to ignore all that. Laughing, Sammy hands me a shot glass, then picks up her own and throws it back, coughing when the tequila hits the back of her throat. Okay, so what else can we do to provoke him? I mean, I'm drinking and dancing in a tiny dress and at a bar. The only other thing that would really, really drive him fucking insane is if I lost his security detail and he had no idea where I was. It's so freaking crazy that he has a team of ninja security dudes following you. Have you ever seen them? I shake my head. Nope. I had no idea they were following me until he told me. Weird. So anyway, how do we get rid of your ninja bodyguards? Want me to offer to do them all? Or maybe introduce them to the triplets? You know, they're always down for a gangbang. I spit out the sip of martini I've just taken, covering the table in front of me. Oh my god, I laugh. I could maybe go for a hot ninja warrior type. Rolling my eyes, I wipe my face with a napkin. If you can spot them, then go for it. But I have no clue who they are. I mean, it could be that guy. 
I point to a balding middle-aged man in an ill-fitting suit propped up against the bar, ogling the bartender as she leans over the beer cooler, her boobs clearly visible. Ew. The only time I've managed to lose them was in the crowds at... Pausing, I swallow. At the party. And, well, we all know how that went down. Yeah, she sighs, reaching over and squeezing my hand. Let's get more shots and brainstorm. Throwing out ideas about how I can get away from my security team, who are so good at their job, I've never seen or even sensed them. We drink another two shots each, giggling more and more as the liquor kicks in. Oh, oh, I have it. Leaning over, she presses her lips against my ear. Let's swap clothes, then you sneak out the back door, and I'll stay here, looking like you, looking like you, looking like you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. So um, remember to enter this week's giveaway for a chance to win a signed copy of Obsession. Um, check out uh, her pre-order she's got up for Loving the Mountain Man. That's out in January. And if you like what you're listening to, the second half will be on Thursday's episode, or you can download Obsession now and read more about this couple. Yep. So that's it. I think that's it. <laughs> yep. Tell them what to do. Knock your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book, that's fine. Or you could sit back, relax, and unwind and read.